today, I'm sorry, the New Testament reading today comes from Luke chapter 15. We're going to read the entire chapter because it all fits together. Jesus is speaking the same points in this entire chapter. You can find it if you want to follow along in the Pew Bibles on page 1623. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me! I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So, he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fat calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The old, older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. 
My son, the father said, you were always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is the word of the Lord. Now, the New Testament reading today contains some of the most well-known of Jesus' parables. Almost everyone can tell you about the parable of the lost sheep or the story of the prodigal son. After reading the first two verses of this passage, we need to understand that the entire rest of the chapter is most certainly directed at the Pharisees and the teachers who are muttering against Jesus. Did you notice the commonalities in these three parables? There was something lost, a sheep, a corn, a coin, and of course, a wayward son. Second, what was lost was eventually found. Now, in the case of the prodigal son, one could argue the son wasn't actually found. He came home on his own. But his father regarding him, regarded him as being found. Finally, in each case, there was joyous celebration when what was lost was eventually found. In the parables about the lost sheep and the lost coin, Jesus tells everyone there will be much rejoicing in heaven over just one sinner who repents. Obviously, the lost sheep and the lost coin represent sinners that have, been, that have repented. With these parables, Jesus is also making the, comp the comparison that God the Father will continually search for the lost in order to bring them into his eternal but there's a twist in the parable of the prodigal son. You see, the prodigal son, the younger brother, wasn't simply lost. He made a deliberate decision to leave his father's home. After finally realizing that he'd made a terrible mistake, he also made the decision to repent. We see in our reading that he actually rehearsed what he was going to say. And all he was going to ask for was to be treated like one of his father's hired hands. But all the son managed to say before his father swept him up was, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Then the rejoicing began. Generally, that's where our focus ends. But Jesus didn't end his lesson there. He relates what happens when the eldest brother hears what's going on. I wonder why we don't talk about the reaction of the eldest brother very often. Maybe because it might hit too close to home. Maybe there is at least a little bit maybe a lot, of the elder brother in each one of us. One morning, some preachers were discussing this parable when the subject of the elder brother and his identity came up. Notice we don't have any names for the three main characters here. They were trying to figure out who he was. One older preacher spoke up and said, I know who he is. In fact, I saw him just today. The other ministers, eager to hear his response, asked, Well, who is he? The wise old preacher said, He's me. You see, as Jesus reaches the end of this parable, he's talking about lost things. He's still dealing with with the attitude of the Pharisees and teachers toward lost sinners. The elder brother is an example of a person who's involved in the things of God, 
but who has no real relationship with God. He's in the Father's house, but he's lost. He's off in that far country in his heart. Jesus is demonstrating to the Pharisees and teachers that he is them. They're all about the law, not the relationship with God. The older preacher was admitting that sometimes he is also out of relationship with God and is just going through the motions. The younger son was lost in the far country. The older brother was lost in his father's house. The younger son was a lost hedonist. He lived for pleasure. The elder brother was a lost moralist. He lived to maintain appearances. There are two ways we can be lost. One is to break the rules and do as we please. This is how the younger brother lived. Another way is to keep all the rules and to be good. This is how the younger brother lived, and he was lost too. Wait, what? We don't, we don't get this because we often equate being good with being saved. But if we're only being good to earn favor with God, we're still lost. The gospel is not be good and you will be saved. The gospel is, be saved and you will be good. There are two messages in this parable. One is that, the sinners, that sinners need to repent, and they can be saved. And the heavens will rejoice at their salvation. The other is a message to those who have already been saved, but have the same attitude as the older brother. It speaks to people who are upset when God blesses other people. Or those people who don't rejoice over what God is doing because it isn't being done their way. It speaks to people who are like the older brother. So let's talk about the other prodigal son today. Just to make it easier, let's give you the name. About Clarence. First, Clarence is a leader. He's the oldest. We already read in Deuteronomy that he's entitled to two thirds of his father's possessions. Since his younger brother has already received part of the inheritance, everything else belongs to Clarence. When his father dies, not only will Clarence receive his father's possessions, he will also become the legal and religious head of the family. <clears throat> Clarence is a hard worker. He works in the fields. He's working hard for his father. Clarence stayed home and he worked. He didn't take off to a far country to live it up on his inheritance. All outward appearances make, look, make it look like all is well in this family. And that Clarence and his father get along great. Clarence is a picture of the religious belief. He had God's law and appeared, outwardly at least, that he was walking in the law. He looked good to others, but there was a real problem in his heart. The problem was hidden from human view, but God could see it. He was religious, but he was lost. The same thing can be true of some here. You're a moral person. You come to church, you don't cuss, drink, steal, or cheat. You don't smoke or chew. You kiss girls and do. <laughs> You've been baptized and belong to the church. By all appearances, you're as good or better than anyone around you. But God knows your true condition. You can fool others, but you can't fool God. You can be good, moral, and act 
active in church and still be lost. I'm not trying to make anyone doubt their salvation. I'm just saying that religion doesn't equal salvation. Church membership does not equal conversion. Being close to the things of God does not equal being saved by the grace of God. Being in a church does not make you a Christian any more than sleeping in a garage makes you a car. You must not depend on who you are or what you have done for your salvation. So, as Clarence comes home after a hard day in the fields, he hears celebrating. He's confused. As far as he knows, there's no reason for a celebration in the house. He calls a servant over. The text suggests it was a young boy. And he asks, what's going on? The boy tells him about his brother going, coming home and his father, father killing the fatted calf and throwing a party. When Clarence hears this, he becomes angry. The word means to become red-faced. Picture a person clenching their fists and becoming red with anger. In his actions here, his resentment toward his father and his brother is clearly seen. He didn't love his younger brother. He didn't care that his younger brother had come home. Clarence had already written off his brother and didn't care what happened to him. He was disrespectful to his father. He was resentful of his father's open love for his younger son. He was self-serving, hateful, and condescending. His resentment is clear. When Clarence hears why there's a celebration, he's angry and refuses to go in. His father comes out and pleads with him to come in. His reply is very telling of his heart. He reminds his father of his faithful service and complains that he has never been given a feast for what he has done. The bottom line here is this. He didn't care that his brother had come home and he was angry that it pleased his father. Clarence realized his father was ecstatic with joy, but he refused to go into the biggest celebration his father ever heard. This was a deliberate act of disrespect. It was his way of saying, I won't be part of this family or respect you as the head of it. Evidently, Clarence only worked for what he could get out of it. He saw his service to the Father as slavery. The Greek word used in the original text is doulos, which actually means slave. Clarence is saying, all these years I've been a slave. He didn't serve his father out of love for the father, but out of a desire to help himself. All Clarence can do is whine, pout, and complain. Clarence may be physically at home, but is in the far country in his heart. He's as far away from his brother, from his father, as his brother was. All he really wants to do is live it up like his brother. He won't do it because his pride won't let him. This is what was wrong with the Pharisees. They kept the letter of the law outwardly, but in their hearts they lusted, they hated, and they longed for sin. His father loved Clarence. He came outside to encourage him to come to the feast to celebrate the return of his lost brother. He reminded Clarence that everything was already his. We're told back in verse 11 that he had, he had already divided his property between them. In effect, the father was saying, I value in our, re in our relationship far more than I value your works. Clarence could have enjoyed fellowship with his father anytime he wanted, but apparently he was too wrapped up in his own legalism and narrow-mindedness to realize it. Sound a little bit like the Pharisees? 
Same thing is true in many lives today. People want the church. They want to feel better about themselves. They want a fire insurance policy. A get out of hell free card. But they neglect having an intimate relationship with God. We can be as close to the Lord as we want to be. We have as much fellowship with Him as we want to have. As we read in our Old Testament reading today, the law stated that a stubborn and rebellious son should be presented to the elders of the village and they should stone him, purging the evil from among them. Maybe that's where Clarence was coming from. Why are we celebrating? He should be marched right out of here and be stoned. The law says so. But which brother was more stubborn and rebellious? The young brother repented. Clarence is the one being stubborn and rebelling against his father's wishes. Which brother did each of us identify with? Have we been foolish and rebellious, but are now searching for a closer relationship with God? Or are we putting on a good face, face, but, re, but neglecting our relationship with God, not our Father? Are we working hard doing our Father's work, but not really taking the time to enjoy His loving warmth? My hope is that we all learn to do both. In fact, if we're having an inter intimate relationship with God, God will guide us, will help us. And as we do his work in this world, he'll lead us. Let us all strive first for a loving relationship with God. All of the rest will follow. Please join me as we sing hymn number 498, Lead Me, Guide Me.